and welcome to the second of this morning's sessions. I'm very much looking forward to the papers as they're both very much relevant to my work as a musician and concerts presenter. I have known Dario Marosic as a performer of Istrian traditional music and have heard him in concert. He came into contact with uh, this tradition in his childhood and has been researching it as an ethnomusicologist. He has been playing an important role in the revitalization of traditional groups of music and instruments of Northern and Central Istria. He has worked on several projects for the Croatian Ministry of Culture, also around the practice of violin and bassetto in Istria for inclusion in the Croatian Register of Cultural Heritage. He's active as performer, composer, researcher and teacher, all in the field of Istrian music. He has released three books and 16 albums. Um, the subject of his paper is folk fiddling in Istria. This is of great importance to any performer of Tartini's music, I think, since we feel that we should be able at least to recognize the traces of this tradition in some of this repertoire. I just learned that uh, Dario doesn't have a camera, but he has a PowerPoint presentation. So I hope this works. Hello, are you with us? Yeah, do I have some something? I don't know. Yes, you of course. Hear me? Yeah, yes. okay, super. So you see that because I don't know, I'm the first time on such a online uh, presentations and so on, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I will be clever enough. I hope so. I think you have to share your presentation. If you uh, share a portion of your screen. Yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying, yes. Uh, does it happen something? Uh-huh, yeah, no. Yeah, sure. Yes. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, good morning to everyone. I was following a little bit this morning. Yesterday I was not at home. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry for the camera because uh, I am, uh, the situation is as it is today, I'm living in a village and just outside of the village. So I, there was not a possibility to buy it one and I will remain like this, but it's not a bad story. So uh, folk fiddling in Istria, as we said. Uh, the instrumental folk music of Northern Istria is definitely uh, transnational in nature. What does it mean? Uh, does it mean that uh, uh, Croats, Italians, and Slovenes share an almost identical instrumental and dance repertoire, and which differs from place to place only in the frequency of some melodies? And uh, uh, the reason for, for such a situation, uh, it could be an, an mutual exchanges and so on, but it's not, not only. It's also a, a non Istrian influences that they have in common. Uh, so, uh, Istria is characterized mainly by the groups known as Gunzi, but also Pisciazzi and Zingelsi, as if, and other names uh, as well. So, whose uh, core consists of fiddle and two strings, small so double bass. That could be more and more. Um, fiddles, but it depends on the situation. So some authors of the past, like, uh, don't know, like Vidossi and Facchinetti, they assume that the fiddle and bass were introduced by traveling musicians, the so-called Zigozaini, uh, from, uh, who came from Carnia and Friuli. So the context between Northern Istria and Friuli uh, is, an, is an ancient, uh, ancient uh, uh, issue. And the Friulian influence on Istria and uh, particularly that history and uh, North Istria on the history and musical traditions is significant. So over time, uh, the Zigozaini began to be increasingly, increasingly invited as musicians to the weddings of richer families because there was, I don't know, something new and something very, very, very fashionable at the time and so on. And uh, so uh, this uh, frequent presence of, uh, of these groups uh, introduced a new aesthetic and especially with, uh, with the new repertoire, 
but also using instruments uh, previously known in Istria. So like the fiddle, the fiddle was documented already in the 17th century uh, here. And all this together, they, it led to a creation of local groups. So uh, until today, the Kunzi uh, last in, in, in the area of Buzet and Buye, while in the past they were present uh, much wider. Uh, we see on this, this picture. Uh, in the 20th century, uh, their presence was documented in about 70 uh, uh, villages. And we know that at least in 50 of them, there were uh, local musicians. So, uh, uh, the fiddle. Say so that's, uh, sorry, yeah. The fiddle called uh, violin, shkant, Pichu Zigizun, Zinglich, Malagigla, there's different names that the people used to, to how to find this instrument. So the fiddles were mostly uh, purchased instruments of non Istrian origin, so mainly made in Trieste and Bohemia. But some are also products of local makers, so the, the, the two instruments are, are, are Istrian made. And uh, uh, often, uh, often are noticed adaptations and the replacement of some parts like the bridge, nuts, and some posts. On some factory-made fiddlers, fiddles, also on two of them, we, we, we had a, a, a chance to, to, to compare with other instruments. So the original neck was replaced by a new one and attached, this new one is attached on the style of Baroque instruments, so straight on the, on the body. And some uh, homemade fiddles have, uh, have even a flat back. So the bows are usually common, uh, you see here on the picture, is a, it usually is a common bow, but sometimes a homemade shorter and heavy one is used for a second fiddle. So the three, the three bows that you see here are for, for the second fiddle. Uh, so although different from an organological point of view, but it's worth mentioning uh, this reed fiddle, violin utcanele or violin cicitecana. It's in fact an arundo donax tube with two strings. So instead of a bow, a sorghum stick coated with rosin is used to play uh, this instrument. So many musicians in their childhood, they started to, to learn the repertoire on such instrument. The bass or bass, the bass is the bass called the bass, leron, grando zigizun, vela gigla. And their dimensions range from a small bass uh, to a cello. Like fiddle, fiddles, uh, also the bass, uh, the basses have different origins, uh, mainly both by Carnelli, the, that's the travel musicians that I, I, I said at the beginning, and Roma traveling musicians, or uh, purchased in Trieste. That was common, uh, the market for Istria. So, but not, it was not rarely that they were also made in Istria. Uh, Istrian bass have only two gut strings in fifth and rarely fourth tuning. So it happened even on instruments that originally they were built uh, in uh, with three, uh, three or four strings. They both uh, an instrument that, that has three or four strings and they, they just, just uh, uh, put two strings on it. Uh, some basses uh, were hollowed out of a tree, uh, tree trunk so that the neck Back, you can see it here. If you can understand, it's from one one piece, one one piece of wood, and so the the back, the neck, back and sides, they are and and they were made just from 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 this one piece. So uh, the most interesting uh, feature of the bay bias is the bridge shape. It's particular. You see here on the on the on your screen. Uh, uh, in fact, the instrument does not have the sound post in the true sense, as we know in, 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 in uh, such instruments. But uh, this role uh, of the sun post is taken over by one foot of the bridge, which is longer and rests to the bottom of the instruments through a rectangular opening on the soundboard. So this interesting shape of the bridge is not only, uh, only history and peculiarity, we can, we can find it in Poland, mainly in Poland and, and Slovakia, as well, they are also on some violins, the same, the same, the same construction. So uh, uh, 
but we can find also such uh, bass instruments uh, with, with such feature you have in Castello del Principe in Merano and, and in Carnia. In, in, uh, there's one, 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 one musician from, the, from Carnia, from the Carnia Alps, they have, he has an instrument like this and uh, one is on uh, uh, Tormezzo, Tormezzo Museum. So, uh, historically, this kind of bridge is documented in the 16th century on a painting exposed in Goldeck Castle in Austria, is the, the, the left one, and uh, also depicted in uh, uh, Reuter Lidlin, its book uh, printed in Frankfurt and Main in the, in the 16th century. It's the right one. So the fiddlers hold the neck of the instrument uh, in the palm of their hand between thumb and forefinger and with the wrist pressing against the ribs. The fiddler rests on the musician's clavicle or even lower against, against the chest. So most of the fiddlers, uh, they are mainly, uh, they use mainly three fingers, just three fingers on the first position. Uh, the vibrato is not uh, so common, but it, it happens and it's always uh, performed alternating uh, different pressure on the string not like a classical way of, of doing the vibrato. Estartini, as well, he says, alzando un poco il dito della corda. We must have in mind that uh, this, is, uh, this and few other ornaments are improvised uh, during the performance. Uh, so it happens or <laughs> it doesn't happen. Um, as each da capo, that's important, that's at each da capo, uh, it, uh, every da capo is a variation, in fact, uh, but uh, the, the diminution is the basic way to make the change. So the older fiddlers always used to, to play on double strings with the empty one as a drone, but some of them in certain tunes use also a real double stop. Um, when we started our research uh, at the beginning of the 70s, the use of double strings uh, was still almost the rule, and the second fiddle uh, played accompaniment in two manners, in the manner of Shekundivanye. It's a, a kind of a rhythmic accompaniment, playing chords and or, we uh, see uh, two note chords as well, uh, or uh, compiamento. It's another way, it's a fulfillment with another melody, a kind of melody, very, very not, not a big melody, but something that, that it's, it's in tune with that. And, so uh, we can now try to to listen to listen to to this uh, uh, one example, so that we don't talk about music. Yeah. Sorry, we can't hear anything for now. Mm -hmm. Dario, we don't have any sound. Dario, try to uh, share screen again. And, no, no, uh, I, I just unmute because I muted the, the, the mic, as you say, maybe I will try with. Did you press while you share screen, share computer sound, the small um, option there in the left corner? I don't know, but you heard me when, when I, was, I, was, I was talking. Yes. So let's try with this. Okay, maybe I hope that it will work now. Come on. 
Yeah, and uh, this is the, the three guys there on the picture. They were playing this this uh, this uh, uh, tune, and uh, we have. I, I chose this tune. This was the only one because it was too complicated to find out material I have at home. But and uh, uh, the three guys, uh, they uh, because in, in this tune there are a lot of elements that we are talking about. So we have this uh, uh, first violin, the compiamento. So the second violin playing, playing this compiamento way of, of, uh, of uh, accompaniment. And, uh, and the bass playing a sort of, uh, uh, that's common uh, among the old, old musicians, I will say later as well, uh, on the bass is uh, it's a sort of, uh, of uh, um, bass ostinato. That's, that's a small pattern and they, they continue this pattern uh, through, through, throughout all the song. And, uh, uh, so we go further, yeah, hope. So the second, uh, uh, as I say, the second fiddle, they used to, to rest, is different way of keeping the instrument. And the second fiddle used to rest uh, with the ribs upright on the left or right shoulder. So uh, on, the, on the chest, under the chin. So not so common, but uh, instead of the second violin, it, it was also used uh, the viola. So we have three musicians, so this one, Playing the second violin, and uh, and uh, you will see uh, then this one is holding almost on the right, on the right, uh, on the right shoulder, against the right shoulder. It is the same the same uh, uh, violin player that uh, if you see on the on the on, uh, uh, when uh, when I show this one is this one here. So when he plays the first violin, he keeps the, the violin like this. This one was the second. And when when this the same the same uh, the musician when he plays a, a, a accompaniment he holds the uh, holds the, the the instrument in a different way, so or this way under 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 the chin. So uh, the Gunzi repertoire uh, consisted of mainly of dances. I say uh, consisted because uh, today. It, Today it's not so so uh, so popular this kind of music, but it still exists groups. Eh? So it consists of dances as well as wedding and carnival marches, and because of, uh, of the present day dancers, they don't know to dance some dances and so on. That as as all around the history, only polkas and, and waltzes are still performed, and so a uh, few other tunes like Zupich or Bashovien or other other dances. With, with the particular tunes and so on, they were adapted uh, rhythmically and, and with the structure to those new dances. Uh, I mean, new dances, the, the polkas and, and the, the waltz and so on. So uh, already in the 40s, uh, the arie, there was a tunes arie, there was tunes in rubato writing, uh, uh, mainly songs, uh, melody of songs, but also more rubato and so on. And uh, they used to be played in front of the bride's house and they started to disappear already at that time. So the structure of the compositions is built uh, uh, alternating the ton uh, tonalities of tonic and dominant or dominant and subdominant. So the number of the repetitions uh, is not strictly defined, but it's usually uneven. So the end is always on the original key with the addition of a coda a la longa na duo. We heard it on, on, the, on, the, on that uh, musical example as well. And uh, the prevailing scales, they are the major scale, but there's also a very common the Lydian and the Mixolydian scale. So uh, uh, other bass, bass, bass players accompany the tunes, older bass players, they accompany the tune with that uh, rhythmic drones, just uh, sometimes just a drone uh, uh, on, on one note, but usually on the, on the, on the, on the, uh, changing the uh, dominant, dominant and, 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 and tonic and vice versa, but more, uh, more, more, more than just dominant, the first because they use the dominant as, uh, as a note, uh, uh, as a note that exists also on the, on, in the harmony of, of, the, of the tonic harmony, on the harmony of, of the tunes. And we must say that, that the idea the old, the old uh, uh, bass players or the musicians as well, uh, uh, the other musicians, as well, uh, they they didn't uh, consider uh, they didn't have this harmonic harmonic way of thinking, but it's uh, uh, that's just two parts they take. That's it's like like is in Resia we know Natusto in Atenko and so on. So we have one one melody and the, and 
the bass is just another parallel melody. Uh, so uh, uh, they, I say that, that old players, they accompany tunes with rhythmic drones, but, uh, uh, or this ostinato, this ostinato modus that, that we heard on the, on the uh, musical example. So uh, while the younger, the younger are different, they are hardly influenced by, by bass instruments from the, the, the brass bands, the, the, the classical pam, 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 this way. Of, of, of doing the, the part, the bass part. So the musicians uh, were almost all amateurs or semi-professionals and but good opportunities for, for, for get money, a better income. Uh, there were weddings and dance parties where dances were auctioned. So it was an auction and uh, he, who won the auction, he, he, ha he had uh, a right to dance and to, to let other people dance or not. He was his dance, but so it, 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 the, the people that had a lot of money, so it was, it was uh, it's very, very dangerous that they, they will dance all, all the night, just, just he and, and his couples and so on. And so uh, every, every, uh, and uh, so the, uh, I get mistakes, so I forgot something that uh, in fact, this uh, uh, auction dances uh, consisted of a suite, not an individual dance. There was a whole suite, and between the suites, the, the, the different suites, there was two or three uh, free dances for all the people. And uh, the name, what is interesting is that the, the, this name, uh, the name of the suite, uh, this kind of suite was Partida, like in the epoch of Baroque for a suite and so on. So with the uh, advent of brass music, the basic of music theory, uh, they began to spread throughout the villages. In most cases, all, uh, cases, only the band master, in fact, was musically trained and the rest they played according to, to, to his instructions. And everyone got his part from which he, has, uh, he was not allowed to, to deviate. He had to play the part that you have. And so this unification uh, set new aesthetic standards in contrast to the earlier relative freedom that have those, uh, those, those wunti of individual interpretation and variation, improvisation some way, and so on. So among the people, only brass music this, uh, was, was considered real music. So while the fiddlers and bass players, they become just uh, those who play the old fashioned way, let's say, Postarinsky. The reason for ab abandoning the fiddle uh, should also be sought in the arrival of the diatonic accordion, because uh, it, it, uh, it started to play a leading role in the folk music of the region and uh, beside the modernity of the accordion as a modern instrument. So the people uh, started to follow this instrument, but it was also the economic factor that prevailed. After all, the accordionist in contrast to the previous, uh, the two, uh, we say minimal of two, two, at least two musicians, uh, he could perform alone. So many fiddlers just simply switched uh, to the accordion. Another problem was the introduction of new tonalities and modulation types, which some fiddlers tried to solve, not always successfully retuning, uh, retuning their instruments. Uh, in any case, the fiddler became only an optional member of the group. And in this, in this context, the old fiddle techniques uh, uh, did not continue. More authentic fiddlers are still today, the people who continue to play the instrument out of a personal choice or in an old fashioned way, a model style, let's say, in a small group or even alone, just at home. So ultimately, the, the, the disappearance of the Gunzi was also uh, influenced by a post-war, uh, Second World War, uh, events which uh, led to strong emigration, especially from the Buya region, region where there was uh, this, this uh, groups uh, very, very um, uh, numerous. Sorry, Dario, we are running out of time a little. If we want to have questions, perhaps you could... Uh... Yeah, I had something about Tartini, but I, I think it's not long, but there are just three, three issues, if I can just point on it, if it's possible. Yes, please, yes. Yeah, so uh, the, the first, uh, it's true that Tartini, uh, we, uh, in Tartini we find folk music melodies. And uh, as he says that in Venice, he pays uh, his fee bl to blind violin players and so on. Uh, this is... Uh, this, I mean, this, uh, what says Tartini is the most uh, concrete trace that we have of his interest in folk uh, violin music. My opinion is that it would be worth looking for those influences in the first place in the Veneto area. 
the second, I find it very vague, the, the assumption of Tartini's link with history and descant to part polyphony, because as far as we know uh, about history and descant, there is no trace that they would have ever been present outside the history of linguistic zone in southern Istria. And I don't think the young Tartini has traveled that far. Uh, at the time. So, uh, however, I, uh, similar musical styles existed until recent times in Mark and Umbria regions, as well uh, uh, as traces of them we can also find, uh, has been find, uh, found in Romania and in the Venetian Lagoon. And the third, uh, concerning the Dalmatian uh, nation, he said whose music does not have specific intervals and so on and so on, Tartini may have uh, uh, come into contact with Dalmatians either, uh, either in the, uh, Ancona as one of the most important ports for ships coming from Dalmatia or in Assisi through meetings with some pilgrims, but also in Venice among the, the it's a large numerous uh, Sclavonian mostly Dalmatian community. However, uh, it's also true that uh, that uh, uh, there uh, there is a possibility that the young Tartini has come into contact with the melodies of the Slavic liturgy Glagolitic lit liturgy at the Glagolitic monastery in Koper Capodistria. So I think that until at least one melody uh, is identified as uh, explicitly coming from Eastern repertoires, uh, all supposition could be fascinating, but it still remains only a guesswork. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. This was this was really very interesting. Um, I uh, has anyone uh, got questions? Yes, please, Roberta. Many thanks for this very interesting paper. Uh, and the first is only a personal note because my grand uncle is a Slovenian. Uh, he was a accordion player, but I have no, <laughs> no idea if he uh, was also a fiddler. Um, but anyway, um, the first uh, small question is um, because you mentioned uh, Roma musician, uh, Roma, or at least as a, maybe a Roma musician. Um, do you have uh, any uh, information if there is a transmission or diffusion of the Bunkos uh, tradition in the Slovenian area? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, with the, the, the things that I know uh, that I used to find out and so on, uh, that has a connection, or really a connection out of just this, this um, uh, uh, data that, that were uh, uh, Roma, 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 uh, German musicians. There are some tunes that uh, they, they, are, they are called uh, uh, Cigana Banda. One is Cigana Banda, yeah, Cigana, Cigana Banda, and so on. Yeah. yeah, and we have a tune that we know it uh, also called Cigan, Ciganska, and I know it because I found it the same tune. Okay, a, a little modification and so on, on a local way, but it's the same tune that uh, is from uh, from uh, uh, the um, Moldavia, but the Moldavia in 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 um, in Romania, and it's the same tune. But uh, uh, so it could be interesting. I don't know. They call it Siganska because uh, for them, everybody who, who uh, at the time that came from from Eastern Europe, they 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 they, they, they take them as as Cigani. And, uh, yeah, but, yeah, but uh, it's a, a mid-European phenomenon and it, it lets the ground for the so-called still and gras in Vienna classicism or Parisian classicism. For that reason, yeah. my second uh, question would be, do you have any uh, historical evidence or you have- Definitely uh, for Bunkos, not. Uh, maybe, not maybe. for Bunkos, but for this tradition as a how, uh, uh, do you have older um, information about this uh, oral tradition or I think that that uh, uh, most of the tunes that we know, uh, the old that we call, call older tunes, they are from uh, that we know exactly. So it's they are from the period of uh, of uh, really from austro Hungaria, from the period of of, of the of the of the of the uh, military service that that used to go the people go up there and so on. Uh, we in Istria, that's uh, also you said it, it's uh, we really have have some connection with Slovenia, but as as the territory was was uh, uh, a lot of time Venetian territory, so we have a lot of influences from 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 that side, and but we find out something, and uh, we have the old the really old tunes. Uh, they are two, just two tunes that we say we know that uh, they are old is in 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 Vodnian, Dignano. It's something. It's 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 a sort of. Uh, of Furlana and the lot, I saw that that mm. there are tunes common. We find uh, such such uh, very similar uh, similar uh, tuning also in Lambranzi, 
and mm -hmm. for uh, uh, such tunes. So more than this, uh, yeah, I, I, I never, I never really, really, uh, I found out something that has to do really with Vienna because they have some tunes that that from that peri period is a kind of, of, uh, of melody and so on. But I don't know. It, it's very difficult because today, today, are not a lot of musicians anymore. So. Mm. But at, at least in, maybe in analogy in the matter of Herbunkos, you can work as uh, in, in case of Roma, you have these dynasties of Bihari, of violinist, uh, um, Prima, etc. This is uh, an attempt to make some well. Yeah, so, we are not, our uh, violinists are not, our fiddle players, they are not so, so uh, they are not uh, uh, going so, so, so far on the virtuosity. So that's the big difference. So we have very, 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 uh, uh, simple melodies, and sometimes uh, you have made, you must yes must make uh, an experiments of, of how how these melodies with 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 more uh, with more uh, elements and so could could sound. But it is uh, the, the, uh, one of these uh, uh, thing is is that aria that I says that aria in a free writing it it sounds a little bit let's say a little bit like. Uh, like uh, not uh, with with that with that uh, uh, musicians of uh, of uh, Transylvania to say and, and so on so th th this way of of uh, bellments and, and great notes that you use very free because they they are they were playing alone without the without the bass as well so the fiddle player was completely free to to invent and reinvent uh, those tunes. Yeah, it's like as a great part of the Amerspiel mind being this is yeah. very fascinating topic. Thank yes, you. it is hugely important. Um, I think we have to move to the next paper, but is there any urgent question? I would have many questions, but um, is, is there anything uh, small that, that anybody wanted to ask? Can I ask um, uh, just one thing? Uh, thank you, thank you a lot, uh, Dario Mariusic, for this uh, your this uh, very fascinating uh, um, speech. Uh, I want just to ask if there are some uh, uh, audio materials uh, for this music, some ar archive of this popular music, and uh, if uh, it is possible uh, to listen to to that. Uh, simply or it's difficult just to have um, a better idea of the music. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, uh, you can find it, but I, I don't know, it's not issued and uh, I mean something it is, it is a group, uh, a group Pischiazzi that issued a, a, a cassette in the, the, in the 90s or the end of the 80s, okay. I think, and uh, Trio Cras. That's the mm -hmm. two things, uh, three cassettes. They're all on uh, the on the on the on the audio audio cassette, and uh, it exists. And uh, there is uh, also in um, in Radio Pula uh, is uh, is a guy, but it's not a lot a lot of musicians uh, of this kind. Uh, well, I I have at home a lot a lot of things because I I, I, I do the researches from the seventies. Uh, and uh, okay. uh, but uh, maybe I don't know. I, I can share with you something if you're interested. And uh, I'm working on a, on the on the uh, on the internet internet uh, sites of uh, of uh, violin uh, fiddle fiddle playing of history. So maybe I hope okay. it soon will be will be publicly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Okay. Thank you. I'm afraid we have to move on. And the next paper is a joint paper by Bostian Udovic and Mateusz Stipitz. Uh, it discusses Tartini as a missed opportunity in Slovenian cultural diplomacy. And this is again a problem that I have experienced with many other composers associated with the territory of today's Slovenia, both as performer and concert presenter. Uh, so uh, they're both with us now. Uh, Bostian Udovic is an associate professor in diplomacy at the Faculty of Social Sciences, University of Ljubljana, where he teaches courses related to diplomacy and international political economy. In 2017, he was a guest lecturer at the University of Salzburg. And Matteo Stepetz is a Bachelor of Arts student of international relations interested in diplomatic studies. Please.
So thank you all for joining us today. Um, as a member of a Generation Z, there is a great possibility that I am not familiar with the classical music and uh, authors that produce it. As I have many apps on my smartphone, tablets and computers, uh, my Spotify subscription never offers me any classical music and especially not the music of Giuseppe Trittin. So here pops out an important question. What are the state authorities doing to promote and enhance the recognition of such artists' importance for the national treasury trove on the national and international level? So, um, in our presentation, we go actually several steps back as we try to determine whether Tertini was a local or a national or was a local or national phenomena. So we try to determine the Tertini's position in Slovenia. So, and if Tertini was a national phenomena, how does Slovenia promote Giuseppe Tertini uh, as a cultural product uh, to enhance its nation branding? So to obtain the data, we actually combine the quantitative and qualitative analysis. So among those methods, we use in-depth structured interviews, statistical research analysis, which included, um, which included uh, the statistical analysis of uh, name designation of Giuseppe Tartini and as well the analysis of media coverage that is in any, in any way compared to Giuseppe Tartini as well. So we analyze different primary and secondary sources and as well uh, cultural strategies of the Republic of Slovenia and strategies of culture, tourism on the local and as well national level. So before we dig further, let me bring uh, forward a few examples how the authorities or invested individuals actually uh, try to promote the, try to promote um, try to promote um, an important figures from the history or that are still ongoing. So um, they are very important for the nation branding as a cultural product. So let, let me start at the international level. So um, these are a few examples. So for example, the watch by Franz, uh, Franz Schubert, uh, the, the cup and saucer by Richard Wagner, and another watch by Friedrich Chopin, and also an, an, air, an airport uh, name that was designated to Friedrich Chopin. And of course, uh, the best known uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, Mozart Kugel, and his engraved uh, portrait on one euro, uh, one euro um, coin, one euro, one euro coin. So here an important question pops out again. So is there in any way, um, is there any examples how Slovenia promoted, uh, promoted its cultural heritage by enhancing um, the promotion by cultural product. So these are just a few examples. For example, on the right side, we can see the tea by Jože Plečnik, a very famous architect. Um, this is a tea that I actually haven't tried yet, but uh, it's supposed to be uh, exactly like the one Plečnik drank. And on the right side, we can see the, the cultural product that's, that are designated to Franz Epper so on the right side as well, his engraved portrait with a verse from a uh, Slovenian national anthem that was written by him. And on the left side, we can see the dessert uh, made from figs and chocolate uh, because the figs are actually uh, the, the product of uh, what, what were his symbol, what actually the symbol of Franz Epper So has anything like that uh, been done with in regard of uh, Giuseppe Tartini. Actually, we came across uh, interesting discovery that there exists a dessert that is designated to Giuseppe Tartini. So uh, it is made from the local ingredients. I haven't tried it yet, but of course, when the lockdown is lifted, this will be one of the first things uh, I do to try it. So nevertheless, uh, let us move forward as we try to discover uh, in what other ways did Slovenia uh, promote Giuseppe Tartini as a cultural product. Yeah? So um, we actually, uh, with the use of quantitative analysis, we try to discover um, what, is, uh, what is the usage of Tartini's name. So how, did, uh, how, how was Tartini's name designated to various socio-geographic entities across the world? But for the purposes of this uh, presentation, we only focus, we only focus um, on the Slovenian level. So, 
here we can see that there were 50 name designations, yeah, but there is a huge divide when we take a look at the proportion of regional versus other parts of Slovenia. So um, in 80%, so the 12 name designations were assigned to the region where Tertini lived and worked. So this is Piran and its surrounding Strunjan and Izola as well. So what we have to point out here that um, the variety, um, the actually the diversity of the, those name designations showed, shows uh, a, a broad approach uh, into the cultural tourism actually, because we found uh, the name designation that were assigned to the coffee shops, restaurants, uh, hotels, uh, streets, uh, squares, statues, and we also find a consular, uh, co uh, not sorry, not consular facility, but, uh, but a protocolar facility that has a name designated to it. So we can see once again, uh, a huge difference between the regional names designation and the name designation other parts of Slovenia. So um, outside this region, we have only found uh, three name designations, two in Ljubljana and one in Šintjur. In Ljubljana, um, it was predominantly a private interest to assign those names to the socio-geographic entities. So we found one music school and one music band that was that is carrying uh, Tertini's name in Shintur. This was actually the only example uh, outside outside the the coastal region that Tertini's name was used by the local authorities. So to name uh, to name a street. Um, so as I mentioned before, it is very clear that Tertini is a local phenomenon, and there is let's say a lack of interest on the international on the national level to promote Tertini or to use his name in that regard. So uh, with another with another analysis, we once again uh, try to understand um, how is Tertini perceived by the broader Slovenian public. Yeah? As we analyzed uh, the, the number of the broadcasts that were carried out by the radio and television Slovenia. So this is the main broadcasting agency. Uh, we discovered that there were 74, uh, 74 broadcasts uh, in the year 2020. So from the beginning of the year till the 15th of November, when we when we uh, last updated uh, last updated our our um, our graph. So this is two days uh, two days prior to this presentation. So. We can see here that the majority, the big majority, so 73% of all broadcasts were carried out by the regional program. So when, to make a quick remark here, when you talk about regional program, we have in mind the program that covers the coastal region. So the region of Kopar, this is the region where Tertini was living and working. Yeah. So what about the national level? How did the national broadcasting program performed in comparison to the regional one? We can see that there were actually only in comparison only to uh, only 20 27 percent of the total program uh, was also delivered on the national level so um, here the nature of the program was actually very uh, culturally uh, culturally it was actually of a cultural content yeah we can see for example um, we can see the the, uh, the concert recordings for example uh, historical and cultural reportages and as well, um, 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 programs re regarding uh, the commemoration of uh, the anniversary of uh, Giuseppe Tartini. So, to to complete, so to put those two quantitative analysis into perspective, let us take a look how, in both cases, the figures show that predominantly Giuseppe Tartini is promoted in the region he worked and lived. So we can see the, the left side, uh, the left side presents all the blue, or the blue figures present the name designation and the red figures present, um, present the coverage, uh, the coverage by the region. So in both cases, it is obvious that Tertini is predominantly a local cultural product and it performs quite, quite badly on the national level. So, to complement our uh, our quantitative analysis, um, we conducted uh, qualitative analysis as well. As we've conducted two interviews with uh, with the two interviewees, one from the local and one from the national level. Um, 
and one of the interviewers from uh, from the local level actually told us that municipality of Piran did not have any specific ideas and objectives how to commemorate uh, how to commemorate uh, the the anniversary of Giuseppe Bittartini. So um, they also started uh, quite late with uh, the preparations of the program, and uh, there was actually, let's say, a lack of uh, disposable resources because they only attributed uh, 35,000 uh, 35, uh, euros of resources in that regard. This is quite a small amount if we put into perspective that uh, Tertini is actually the main symbol of Piran. Yeah. So, uh, nevertheless, um, municipality, as there were actually no clear policies on the level of municipality, uh, the municipality of Piran actually ad hoc appointed Dragon Clarissa, a, a well respected a well-respected culture worker from, um, from, from the coastal region. Uh, and he actually, um, he actually, um, he actually uh, prepared a very ambitious plan. Yeah? But unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 situation, uh, the program was only executed in fragments. So uh, there are only, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't completed uh, in, a, in, a total, in, a total, in a total amount. So, Although we understand um, the problems regarding the COVID situation, we still believe that there wasn't uh, enough promotion in regard to Tertini. Uh, the only promotion that was actually done by, by, the, by the local authorities was a promotion on the city buses. And once again, uh, it was limited, to, it was limited to, uh, to the local municipality and it actually outgrown, let's say, a little bit to the surrounding municipalities, but it didn't have a national effect. So this is the idea. Tertini stayed a local brand limited to the coastal region and some Italian cities neighboring the neighboring Slovenian borders. So moving on to the national level. So the main project on the national level was actually the honorable patronage of the President of the Republic of Slovenia, Mr. Boris Paho. Yeah? On the other hand, Ministry for Culture, which is, uh, which is the main apparatus that should, be, uh, that should be engaged into the preparation of such anniversary, did not show an extensive interest. They said that they're already uh, supporting, fi they're already financially supporting another project that is related to Tertini and, it, and that they actually do not have an adequate resources to support such, uh, to support such uh, program. Uh, Radio Television Slovenia, as we've touched it a little bit before, but now let's make a deeper analysis. Uh, so as I mentioned before, there was an extensive uh, reportage from Piran that was dedicated to the program Tertini 250. Yeah? Um, but nevertheless, it was um, it was executed in limited in a limited uh, in a limited uh, extent due to the wet, due to bad weather conditions. Um, there was as well, this is what we actually missed the most, was the lack of musical content, newly produced or newly filmed musical content on the national level by the radio and television Slovenia. Uh, we understand some difficulties regarding COVID, regarding some technical issues, but what pops out the most is uh, the problem or concerns of the musicians regarding, uh, regarding the copyright. So we think that this is once again uh, the problem of the Ministry for Culture, which should be more inclined to support uh, to support the endeavors of uh, the musicians that want to that want to actually promote their team. So, here uh, to make uh, to make like an insight how Slovenians actually perceive their team both on the local and national level, let me bring forward uh, following examples. As, our, as one of our interviews said that Mr. Klaritsa proposed to the local authorities that uh, the celebration of a national holiday that, that was on 25th of June um, should be uh, conducted by the Slovenian Army Orchestra. Yeah? And uh, the program or the concert should be titled Slovenian Army Place 13. Yeah? Uh, the quick remark here: the concert uh, was uh, took place in in Piran, so that you get uh, this perspective as well. So, as we analyze, the concert actually was done, but it carried out a different name. 
So the name, the name was the Concert of Slovenian Army Orchestra on the National Day. Yeah. Um, what 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 is actually my point here? That uh, Tertini's name was completely cut out, even though the orchestra plays one Tertini song and the and the concert actually happened in Piran. So this obviously tells you that the authorities believe that Tertini is not, uh, Tertini does not deserve uh, the coverage uh, on the national level and the broader civilian public does not deserve um, that Tertini should be uh, presented as a cultural product on a national level. So finally, let us move forward to the international level. So here, can, here we can report um, that there were some, that there are some cooperation um, within the Interact Italy Slovenia 2014 2020 initiative. So, their aim is to promote Tertinia's culture heritage in the areas that Tertinia lived and worked in. So, this is limited to the area, to the coastal region of Slovenia and uh, the region in Italy where Tertini was present in his time. So, uh, we have as well conducted, as I mentioned before, an interview with a source close to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, as we try to uh, understand what has been done on a broader level, what did Slovenia do to promote Tertini outside the state borders? Yeah, and uh, we discovered that actually the Department for uh, for Cooperation, International Cooperation in Culture, uh, did ask uh, the Slovenian um, consular and diplomatic services around the world to commemorate the 250th anniversary of Giuseppe Tartini, but unfortunately due to the COVID situation, um, the embassies did uh, redirect their attention uh, to providing um, the consular service uh, for their citizens in it. Of course, this is understandable. But nevertheless, as we've mentioned all of the, all of the layers, let us make a few conclusions regarding our discovery. So first, Tertini is a local phenomenon promoted by invested individuals, predominantly from the local and regional level. Secondly, Tertini is poorly perceived by the broader Slovenian public. This could be a problem. Here, actually, we have uh, two uh, sub-questions uh, that we'd like to further discover as well. Uh, is, that actually, is that actually the problem that Tertini was actually an Italian, an Italian musicians and Slovenians failed to internalize him as a part of broader Slovenian cultural heritage? Or on the other hand, uh, that this is a problem that Tertini was poorly promoted on the national level and therefore Slovenians failed to internalize with him as well. So third point here is that there is a lack of cooperation among actors on the national level. So within the national level and as well outside the national border. So within the, within the national level, we mean that there is a lack of cooperation in the ministries that are in charge of promoting the culture and as well outside the national border. So the cooperation within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs on one hand and the Slovenian consular and diplomatic services on the other. The last but not least point to make here is that Tertini is a local product. Not only, uh, Tertini is not a local product only because the state authorities do not acknowledge him, uh, but as well because local actors show too little eagerness to encourage the state that Tertini is worth becoming a national product. So in order that Tertini is established as a cultural brand of Republic of Slovenia, local authorities should attribute more towards Tertini's promotion and as well simultaneously feel entitled to demand much more comprehensive, uh, much more comprehensive input from the state authority. So maybe in year 2022, when we celebrate the 330th anniversary of Giuseppe Tertini, so his, of his birthday, yeah, uh, the situation will be much more prosperous and probably let's say hopefully different, uh, the Tertini will be much better recognized on the national level. So I thank you all for your attention and we both with the Professor Udovic are open to any sorts of question that may arise during uh, our presentation. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. 
uh, I mean, this is not good news, but it's supported uh, so well with, with all this data. And uh, yeah, do, does anybody has, have questions, by the way? May I comment? Yes, please. Thank you. First of all, I would like to congratulate Udovic and Stepets for the subject of this presentation that uh, has a critical and quite courageous character. I think since uh, the problem uh, is true, I would just like to uh, uh, pamper the subject with some uh, uh, new elements that are uh, arising from the experience of the implementation of the project uh, uh, Tartini funded by the Interreg program. Uh, I, first of all, there, there is clearly a difficulty in wording about the Tartini identity in Slovenia. It is more simple in Piran where it is a son of the town and uh, enough. But at Slovenian level, there is a, a question mark and quite an embarrass to speak about this identity. I think there are two very interesting uh, uh, examples that I found along this experience. Uh, one in the wording of Ljubljana Festival, speaking of uh, Tartini as uh, a giant of uh, 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 is of music history and uh, as an heritage that the Slovenia Republic has the responsibility to preserve and make the most for the human culture. This is in the presentation of the concert organized by Ljubljana Festival within the pro in Piran in summer 2018. Uh, another interesting uh, uh, wording is uh, in the presentation of the strategy for Slovene cultural tourism by the tourism agency at national level, where uh, speaking of uh, the main persons uh, uh, that are born in what is uh, modern Slovenia territory, mention five, among them also Giuseppe Tartini. Uh, these are two uh, kind uh, uh, approaches, I think, that uh, uh, would pave the way to a more uh, appropriate, on one hand, and uh, widespread uh, uh, attention and uh, a presentation of Tartini in the Slovenian uh, uh, dimension. Even if uh, uh, personally I don't agree with the idea of uh, a disregarding by Slovene public uh, uh, to Tartini's work, uh, because we found uh, a very large uh, attention, participation, and consideration of its uh, 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 of its uh, works and the presentation made by by along the project, and also by the accesses uh, to the uh, website. Uh, uh, you know, as uh, uh, discovertartini.eu. Uh, just uh, one uh, uh, one ad additional uh, uh, consideration is that, uh, uh, for instance, and still along the project, Ljubljana Festival was in the post to uh, uh, introduce Marti uh, Tartini in the market of international tourism and did it so uh, managing uh, a stand on Giuseppe Tartini within the Slovenian tourism agency uh, uh, participation to the London International Tourism Fair in uh, October 2019 
and to the Ljubljana International Fair for Tourism in the month of no November. Uh, that, thus, uh, uh, stressing a commitment uh, also at national level uh, by the bodies responsible for the uh, Slovenian tourism uh, policy. Last but not least, as we, we, we stressed uh, uh, with the publication of uh, promotional uh, papers uh, on uh, uh, Discover Tartini in languages like uh, Japanese, uh, Spanish, uh, uh, Russian, uh, and, uh, and so on, uh, the result of this project and the availability of uh, uh, the uh, Tartini's work worldwide uh, marks uh, an ambition uh, to bring Tartini directly at the uh, world uh, uh, level, as uh, it, he is uh, recognized, uh, for instance, uh, in the uh, Massachusetts University as one of the 20 main musicians of uh, uh, music history. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, well, are there some questions? I would just comment that, um, I mean, this was uh, a great amount of, of, of data. Um, what I have uh, experienced is also the, not only the quantitative, but also the qualitative um, side of um, presentation of Tartini's work in, in Slovenia. For example, I've uh, myself had to play the, the Devil's Trill many times in, in very strange arrangements um, <laughs> from the early 20th century. Also, uh, I think uh, Chrysler's arrangement is, is very popular. And this is the piece that is actually uh, mostly, has been mostly performed in the past few years. Uh, I see it all the time and it doesn't uh, do justice to, to Tartini and, and I can't understand how people can be uh, so blind. <laughs> If I may add here, if there are no questions, maybe as a co-author of this presentation, um, maybe just a few remarks about the main issue coming from the coast, coming from the municipality of Piran, not being from Piran directly, but coming from the same municipality. I can say that, you know, Tartini is not just a local phenomenon. It's a problem that is mostly related, and I was now looking on this Bible that is, it was the Bible on the uh, 2050th anniversary uh, of Tartini, and I was looking around, so it is most linked to the Italian minority in Peran. So you're having here, out of seven main partners of this project, it was 250th anniversary, it was uh, Coro Giuseppe Tartini, so it was uh, Carlo Combi, it was the Can, uh, and uh, Ricerca di Studi Storici, so four out of seven were the partners coming from the Italian minority. So it is a reductionist perspective about the uh, Giuseppe Tartini. If we in Piran, uh, we don't have it quite clear cut. It was presented by Mr. Poli that, yeah, it was, it was done, but it was done too little. Uh, not just for the promotion of Tartini. I was following the Hugo Wolf. We, we celebrated the nearest this year in Slovenia and broadcasting issues or broadcasting possibilities for Hugo Wolf were quite more, how to say, expanded comparing to Tartini. This is the one possibility that maybe we should improve in 2022. And the next issue is, you know, also in Piran, yes, as it was said by Mr. Marincic, um, we are always hearing about the devils. Uh, so, you know, it is not the only composition of Tartini and you're having lots of, I don't know, Canzoncine Sacre, you're having lots of other musical pieces that are unknown to the region, not later on to the country. So I think here a step forward should be a closer cooperation between the local levels to the municipality of Piran uh, and the culture, uh, the cultural institutions there with the national level but on the other hand, what is important is that also Ljubljana being the capital and all the ministers being here, they're going to acknowledge or they should acknowledge that Tartini is part of the Slovenian tradition, not matter it was Venetian or it was not, it was Italian, it was not. Nowadays, it is part of the Slovenian tradition and we should make it as a national product. Like, I don't know, we are making some other, it was presented, I don't know, uh, Preshiran or Plechnik or whoever it is. So we have lots of those possibilities, but to end, 
uh, musicians in this country, they are treated sometimes as being just a par part of culture, not part of national identity. And that is why if you would like to have an effective cultural diplomacy promoting your country abroad, you can do it in the modern times of international relations, especially through culture, because we don't have wars anymore. We don't have economic benefits. Okay, they are, but they are sidelines. So, you know, culture is one to what can promote your country, not only in the neighboring country, but also in uh, far distant uh, levels and far distant countries. So I'm going to stop here. Yes, thank you very much. I, I agree uh, com completely. Um, so is there any other remark? Um, otherwise, I think uh, it's best to, to go to the break and uh, continue at two o'clock.